Chapter 8, Air and Air Pollution. We might typically think of air pollution as being a problem in a place like Los Angeles or some other big city, but along with that local problem is that there's this global distillation effect, or even air pollution that's created in one place in the world because of the way it can be transported via air can create pollution problems in areas where there are basically no cities, no sources of pollution. So these toxins that are generated in, uh, again, cities and other uh, industrial areas because of transportation by air can have impacts in places that are otherwise pristine. Unfortunately, we could go for a hike in, in just about any wilderness area in California or probably most of the western United States and find some level of air pollution uh, as indicated by brown spots on, on needles of trees. Not enough pollution that would kill those trees, but certainly the signs of it being there are, are obvious if you kind of know what you're looking for. And then you've got the challenge of when these chemicals get in the atmosphere, they tend to move from warmer regions to higher elevations and to cooler latitudes where they then, uh, because of the cold air being heavier, sink back to the surface of the earth. And so that's where they tend to then have that negative impact. Another challenge are chemicals like PCBs uh, and a chemical we've already spoken about, DDT. Because they are fat soluble chemicals, they can get into a system, be accumulated up a food chain, and then the top predator whether it's something like a polar bear or a human, ingests those chemicals, the chemicals get stored in the fatty tissues, and then the example that the book starts off with, where the Inuit women who uh, basically have diets that are high in, in fat um, from things like seals or, or whales, then are able to pass those toxins on to their children through their breast milk. So again, what we're going to look at here then is, is sort of the long distance transportation of air pollutants. And certainly these chemicals have the possibility of being able to move great distances just depending on the conditions. In 1908, there was a dust storm in China that basically generated this cloud of toxic metals. Once those soil particles and, and any other contaminants that are with them get kind of put up into the atmosphere, they can be carried long distances by the jet stream, for example. Again, they may, they may be blown thousands of miles from where they were generated, and then when they finally come back to the earth, they can have that negative impact. So just like with the, uh, the Inuit people we were speaking about just a minute ago, certainly animals then can have that same negative impact where if they ingest enough uh, food that contains these chemicals that have been stored in fatty tissue, they can concentrate in the polar bears. And just like the, um, the Inuit women, the polar bear can pass this along to their cubs through their milk and uh, have some negative impacts to the health or development of those cubs. So to understand how these chemicals are, are able to be pushed through the atmosphere, you need to talk a little bit about the atmosphere. Basically, the atmosphere is a bunch of gases that kind of surround the Earth. And without these gases, we basically would not be able to have life exist on this planet. Most of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen, uh, followed by about 21% oxygen, and then a variety of other gases in much lower percentages, including things like carbon dioxide. But we'll kind of come back to this several different places throughout the rest of this course. Even though carbon dioxide is 0.04% of our atmosphere, it may be among the most important gases in our atmosphere. Obviously oxygen is necessary for us to breathe, but without that little bit of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, this planet wouldn't be warm enough to have liquid water and basically then it wouldn't be in the right butter zone of temperature to support life.
if we look from the surface of the Earth moving away from the surface of the Earth, our atmosphere is composed of four layers that surround the, the planet. The troposphere is the layer here that we live in. And then above that is the stratosphere, followed by the mesosphere, followed by the thermosphere. We'll look at those in just a little more detail uh, in a few minutes. As I mentioned, if our atmosphere weren't present and in the quantities that it's in, life would not be possible. The atmosphere provides very important ecosystem services. Among other things, one of the very important ecosystem services is that it protects us from receiving too much ultraviolet radiation from space. A little bit of ultraviolet light is necessary for life on this planet. But if the atmosphere were not there, we would basically be bombarded with UV radiation, which is um, bad stuff because it kills cells. And obviously if plant or animal cells are killed, then the plant or animal will be killed. So it filters out most of the UV radiation, but lets just enough through to support life. Also, again, very important is that it provides these greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, CO2, that absorb just enough heat that's going from the surface of the earth as the sun beats down during the daytime and holds just enough of that heat near the surface of the earth. Without the atmosphere as we know it, and basically if there were a lot less CO2 in the atmosphere or other greenhouse gases were not as abundant, during the daytime, there'd be nothing to filter out the sun, and it would get really hot during the daytime, probably too hot to support life because all the water would just evaporate away. And then as soon as the sun set, all of the heat that was down near, near the surface of the Earth would just radiate back to space. So without our atmosphere, the Earth would be too hot during the daytime to live in, and it would definitely be way too cold at night to live in. So going back to the layers um, associated with our atmosphere, again, down here near the surface, we live in the troposphere. The average thickness is about 10 miles at the equator and about half that thickness at the pole, largely because of the movement of the Earth. This is the layer of the atmosphere, again, that we live in. Within this layer, temperatures decrease as we move north or south of the equator. Also, temperatures decrease as we move up in elevation, of course. But also, this is the, uh, the layer where all of our weather occurs. This is where most of our clouds are. This layer is where most of our, our wind and our storms are generated. So again, this is the layer that we most interact with. I mentioned um, the ability of the atmosphere to filter out the UV, that's actually done in the stratosphere, the layer above the troposphere, and what allows the UV radiation to mostly be filtered out is that the stratosphere is where we have the ozone layer. Ozone up in the stratosphere is necessary for our life on this planet, but ozone then becomes a pollutant when it's generated by us down in the troposphere where we're exposed to actually uh, breathing it. There are steady winds in the stratosphere, but no turbulence, which is why generally it's up in the stratosphere, again, above that 10 mile, uh, above the surface of the earth layer where, where planes fly. Again, because there might be steady winds, but no turbulence like there is in the troposphere. And then the mesosphere is above that. And then the one thing I'll mention about the thermosphere, which extends all the way up to 300 miles above the surface of the Earth. This is where, I guess the one interesting thing is the um, northern lights, or the aurora borealis, that um, maybe some of us have been fortunate enough to see couple of images there uh, on the right and left show an aurora borealis. So part of the 
uh, need to understand this is that because of the atmosphere circulation and the pollutants that get into the atmosphere, we have to understand how circulation um, occurs, why it occurs, and again, that will help us understand how much these pollutants can be transported. So circulation of air is ultimately driven by variation in temperature. The sun's energy as it rises in the morning and heats the surface of the earth during the day warms the air above the surface of the earth. Warm air is lighter than cold air, so it tends to rise. As it rises, it might condense and form clouds if there's enough moisture. But ultimately, the higher that air gets, the colder it gets. And eventually, when the air cools enough, it becomes um, denser, heavier, and then it'll sink back to the earth, where it warms again the next day and kind of continues to create this circulation. Ultimately, this process of convection causes the currents that mix the warmer and cooler parts of the atmosphere, the warmer parts near the surface and the cooler parts higher up. If we back away and look at the entire Earth, then we can see how these patterns all play together to create the predictable wind patterns from the trade winds that are near the equator to the westerlies, the farther you get from the equator north and south, to the polar easterlies. So again, basically you have the warm air near the equator where it's getting more consistent sunlight rising. As it starts cooling, it tends to then travel towards the poles from the equator, north and south, and it cools when it gets high enough and then starts descending around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. So this movement of air creates the trade winds that are blowing towards the pole or towards the equator from the north or south. In turn, this then drives the westerlies. Again, as that cooler air is sinking, for example, at 30 degrees north, <clears throat> it's pulling the cooler air that's north of it down to the surface of the earth. And then, again, the combination of the earth's rotation um, causes that air to warm up, move north from 30 degrees north, that air rises up and that pulls the warmer air at 60 degrees north, where it goes up, splits off north and south, and eventually sinks again. So you can see this complex pattern of air circulation that drives these predictable wind patterns around the planet. When you also throw in then the effect of the rotation of the Earth, the wind direction is basically deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere because of the rotation of the Earth. The winds basically that we feel down here are horizontal movements that result from the difference in atmospheric pressure. From uh, Air moves from areas of high pressure towards areas of low pressure. And so that coupled with the planet's rotation. And again, as we saw in the previous slide, there are three prevailing wind patterns that blow north or south of the equator, the polar easterlies, the westerlies, and the trade winds, or what we also call tropical winds. So again, this is what we talk about when we, when we mention the Coriolis effect. It's also the, the effect that basically causes water to flow one direction when it goes down the drain north of the equator and it flows the opposite way if you're south of the equator. So now that we got a little bit of an idea, the big picture of how air currents move, we need to look at the types of air pollutants that occur down here in the troposphere primarily and what those sources are. Now again, keep in mind that um, any chemical, and it could be a gas, a liquid, or a solid, could be considered a type of air pollutant if it's in the atmosphere in levels or concentrations that are enough to cause some sort of negative health effect. And also keep in mind, not all air pollutants are caused by humans. There are natural 
air pollutants that are out there, as well as the man-made or anthropogenic pollutants that uh, we create down here on the surface of the planet. So, starting off, we look at two major categories of air pollutants. We have those that are called primary air pollutants, and those that are called secondary air pollutants. Primary pollutants are chemicals that enter directly into the atmosphere and are harmful in that form. So the oxides of carbon that are generated by burning fossil fuel are harmful in the form they're in. Now again, that doesn't mean they're all uh, deadly, you know, that they're all going to just instantly kill whatever they come in contact with, but they're harmful in the form they're generated if you're exposed to enough of them. Um, an example of a man-made and a natural type of pollutant would be a particulate. Particulates are generated by us in the burning of like diesel fuel, soot from fires, or just when soil gets blown into the atmosphere, small little particles of soil, if for example we inhale them they don't necessarily have a toxin that, that is bad, but you start thinking about inhaling all these little tiny particles and they start clogging up the lungs. They start clogging up the small little spaces where oxygen is uh, exchanged into our blood system. So that could be an example of a natural um, type of pollutant, soil being blown in the air volcanic eruptions, natural fires. Then we also have secondary air pollutants. These are chemicals that actually form in the atmosphere. So something is put into the atmosphere and then it combines and reacts with another either human or natural component and that results in it creating something that is harmful. So I mentioned ozone up in the stratosphere is necessary for life because it filters out UV radiation. However, um, ozone can be formed in the troposphere by, uh, by mixing with um, chemicals in the atmosphere and reacting with uh, sunlight and then other chemicals that are listed in the, in the image there. So some of the primary air pollutants are carbon oxide, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, most hydrocarbons, and particulates. And then secondary air pollutants would be things like sulfuric acid, nitric acid, uh, the pans. These are things that sulfur dioxide, for example. Sulfur emissions from burning fuel, so sulfur gets up into the atmosphere where it combines with the, uh, the water vapor in the atmosphere, the hydrogen, creating, um, again, a mild acid, which is responsible when it comes back to the earth uh, for generating uh, lots of problems that we'll talk about later related to um, you know, ca causing the, the waterways to be uh, uh, basically clear and clean because it's killed all the life in it or affecting the health of forests. So we'll, we'll talk a little more about that later. So again, I mentioned that particulate matter is made up of, of dust, soil particles, fine mists of chemicals. They could be solid or liquid particles, but once they get suspended in the air, then potentially they can be inhaled. Some have toxic effects that could corrode metals and erode stonework on the outside of buildings. But again, even just soil particles that are microscopic are actually worse than larger particles just because the smaller they are, the farther they can get into the respiratory system of an animal. And the smaller they are, again, the more likely they can get in there and clog up the capillaries where we need basically uh, to have those for exchange of oxygen. So examples of particulate matter um, other than soil particles include some of the nitrogen, sulfur, and carbon oxides, hydrocarbons, ozone, and the HAPs that I mentioned before.
So the graphics on the right list um, a variety of pollutants, <clears throat> mention if they're primary or secondary pollutants, and then just give a, a basic characteristic of what those uh, pollutants are. Solid particles, <clears throat> excuse me, liquid droplets, uh, gases, and so forth. So again, probably good to know these pollutants and the category that they exist in. <clears throat> Your book goes then into a little more detail about some of these other uh, types of air pollutants and, and specifically the types of um, impacts they can have on, on us or other living things. The nitrogen oxides generated by burning fossil fuels at high temperature such as in our automobiles, burning gasoline, can create respiratory problems, aggravate people that have respiratory problems like asthma. And these nitrogen oxides, as I mentioned, um, are generated by typically automobiles, uh, but they can also be involved in creating the, the uh, photochemical smog that we see around large cities large cities, lots of people, lots of automobiles, creating lots of nitrogen oxides, and then also the acid precipitation or deposition that we'll talk about later. The sulfur oxides having the primary role in acid precipitation. Just realized that slide says major role in acid position, I should say precipitation. Um, and basically they can cause respiratory in, uh, irritation. Carbon oxides are, are especially scary because they're generally odorless, colorless. You don't really know if they're there. If you have faulty um, systems in your furnace or your stove, you can have carbon oxide leaking. And basically, kind of like a particulate, the, the oxide, carbon oxides can uh, be inhaled, they start affecting the ability of blood to carry oxygen because it kind of binds up the um, iron that would otherwise grab onto oxygen and, and help it get through the blood system. And these carbon oxides, particularly carbon dioxide, are heavily associated with the issues we face with climate change. So you can read through the rest of these, the hydrocarbons, the ozone, and the HAPs. So again, for the purpose of a quiz, make sure you could list some of these or identify whether these are primary or secondary air pollutants, and then characteristics or problems that they cause. we will spend a little time then talking more about ozone. Again, the ozone in the stratosphere protects life on this planet from too much UV radiation. And then when it's generated down here in the troposphere, it's a secondary air pollutant that is a health hazard to us. A lot of research has been done over, over the past decades looking at the effects of uh, ozone on plant growth. And basically those plants that are exposed to higher levels of ozone show damage to their leaves, their roots don't grow as well, they aren't as productive. Again, if they don't have as uh, healthy leaves to photosynthesize, that's where they get their energy. If the root systems aren't as healthy or as vigorous, they have less ability to get the moisture and nutrients from the soil. So again, ultimately, whether or not higher levels of UV directly kill things, they can affect their vigor, affect their health to the point where Ultimately, there could be a large-scale problem. So I mentioned earlier there are two primary sources of these outdoor air pollutants, anthropogenic sources, which are, again, things created by humans. Um, these can basically be uh, very mobile sources. In other words, cars, trucks, planes, trains or um, equipment, engines that are running. And then there are the other stationary sources such as power plants, which are primarily creating emissions from burning coal, 
or uh, also, again, whether it's natural gas or any other fossil fuel, those emissions are being created. The top three sources for these of these stationary sources of, of outdoor air pollutants are chemical industries, metal facilities, and paper plants, just to name kind of the three primary stationary sources. So again, cars, automobiles, and general transportation are one of the two primary sources of the human-caused air pollutants, the primary air pollutants. That's important to know because, again, the more of us there are on the planet, the more likely that we will have more automobiles until or if we ever get to the point where we don't burn gasoline or diesel in automobiles, we're going to keep generating these types of pollutants. And these problems are going to be worse in the cities, but as we just talked about, ultimately the chemicals, wherever they are produced, can have an impact a long way away from where they're produced. The uh, article, uh, What a Scientist Sees About the Eruption of Mount Pinatubo, is, uh, again, a good example of a natural source of air pollution. Again, in this case, particulate matter that was released from the eruption, ash, that kind of stuff, soot, the materials that uh, got blown into the atmosphere. And we know from past uh, fossil record that there were probably huge uh, eruption events in the past that were big enough to have had an impact, even if it was fairly short term, on the climate of the planet. Even the eruption of Mount Pinatubo had an impact on the average global temperature. Again, the image on the upper right, the graph there, shows how following the eruption, within that year after the eruption, the average global temperature dropped several tenths of a degree and then slowly kind of climbed back up over the next three or so years back to some of the what looked to be the average. You look at the graph and again keep in mind what the units are. We're talking you know from about 14.35 degrees Celsius when the eruption occurred in June of 91 down to about 14.1 degrees Celsius the year afterwards. 0.234 degrees doesn't sound like a lot, and it wouldn't be to us. If your temperature in your house changed less than half a degree, you probably wouldn't really notice it. But keep in mind, when we start talking about global temperatures and having global changes, either up or down, it doesn't take a lot to start having some impact. Um, it would take more than a few tenths of a degree to have any serious impact on the vegetation or the life on this planet. But just the fact that one eruption can have even that large of an effect on the global climate for, for several years um, is, is kind of an interesting note. Again, it was a temporary interruption to the warming trend that we were seeing, but uh, nevertheless, it had an impact. So ultimately, we know all of the different types of air pollutants can injure living things. Some could kill outright, but even just injuring or affecting the health. We know that cities that are heavily polluted are, are hazy looking. You can't see as well. The chemicals that we uh, create can actually corrode the materials that we build our society with. Think about the corrosive effect on some chemicals. Not enough to completely rot through the, the metal beams of, of bridges. But decades of these chemicals can have enough of an impact to weaken structures. So now it's not only just, well, you know, so what if it rusts a bridge a little bit? Over decades, think of all the money that it takes then to maintain these structures to keep them safe. So this is just, just one of many examples where air pollution has a direct economic impact on all of us. Because those bridges don't fix themselves, as they say. Some of the other direct impacts on us are respiratory problems, 
Again, because these chemicals are in the air, that means it's likely that we can inhale them. We see higher instances of chronic respiratory problems in children that live near or in the larger cities. Emphysema, chronic bronchitis, just, just an example, I um, had bronchitis off and on as I was growing up, probably because my mom was a smoker, you know, back in those days, smoked in the house and everything else, didn't think much of it. But, you know, it was something I'd have maybe once a year, maybe once every other year. It'd last for a week or two and go away. When I first moved to California, I was uh, living down in the Fresno area, teaching at a college down there for five years before I moved up to Shasta. And immediately upon living in that area, I started getting more serious bronchitis three, four times a year. And then amazingly, as soon as we moved up to the Redding area, and we're actually up in the foothills, but as soon as we got up here, I went back to maybe having it once a year or every couple years. I haven't really had any bronchitis that I can remember now for probably six, seven years. Just the difference of getting out of a more polluted area made a huge difference in in that issue that I was having. Certainly air pollutants can suppress the immune system, make people with a compromised immune system more likely to get ill. It can affect the crop productivity, so all the food that we depend on. Again, just thinking about California, all the food up and down the valley, how productive that uh, uh, vegetable and fruit production is can be dramatically affected by areas with higher pollution. The air pollutants are involved in acid deposition. They're, they're affecting global climate change, ozone depletion. So again, all these things are, are obviously pretty important to us, whether they affect us directly or indirectly. The uh, impacts of these chemicals, these air pollutants, can seriously affect our ability to, to thrive on this planet. Kind of the take-home message is this pie chart here. Again, remember, for the purpose of a quiz, I guess, but just because it's important to realize, transportation accounts for nearly 60% of these air pollutants. So again, the single most um, heavily used technology we have is responsible for a huge amount of our air pollution. Now, you think about how much we value automobiles in the US. We like to have cars, we like to have the freedom they give us to get from place to place whenever we want. Think about as India and China continue to industrialize and as they continue to move towards uh, more people being able to afford automobiles. They're not starting off uh, building electric cars or building hydrogen-powered vehicles. They're starting off building gas-powered vehicles and likely don't have nearly the pollution standards that we do. So this is a huge problem in the developed countries right now. But think about as the rest of the world continues to develop. It's probably going to be scary that this chart is probably going to grow with respect to the percentage uh, that of air pollution caused by transportation. So other fuel combustion, again, fossil fuels making energy is, is another 21%. Industrial process is another 12 and then all the other miscellaneous things account for 10%. So my bottom line point here again is that if automobiles are the biggest source of our air pollutants, and they cause all of the problems that are listed to the left, that's where we need to keep focusing our energy. We've made progress, obviously. We've got more electric vehicles out there, although a lot of people still can't afford them because they're quite a bit more. Or we've got the hybrid vehicles, the gas-electric hybrids, which at least that does decrease the amount of pollutants going out the tailpipe. But we've gone totally away from things like hydrogen. 
not that many years ago, hydrogen was going to be the next technology. And then all of a sudden, electrical vehicles came back. But let's think about this. I'm not saying electric vehicles are bad because when you drive them, they don't make any air pollution if they're purely electric. And they make less air pollution if they're gas electric hybrids. But where do you plug that vehicle in? You go home and plug your electric vehicle into a solar panel? Perfect world, that would be the case. Do you go home and plug it into energy that's generated by wind or, or, or uh, geothermal? Most people that have electric vehicles are still plugging them into their outlet in their garage. And where is that energy coming from? Most of it's still coming from burning fossil fuels. So again, even though they don't make emissions while you're driving an electric vehicle, unless you're plugging it into solar or some other renewable energy, you're still creating air pollution. It's just not coming out the tailpipe. Hydrogen vehicles would solve that problem. Or again, if everybody had solar panels at home, even if it was just to plug their automobiles into their electric cars, that would solve a huge amount of our problem. That would get rid of a, a, a significant percentage of air pollution. But right now, that's not where we are. We still need fossil fuel to charge our electric vehicles. So, again, some of the biggest problems are in urban areas because, again, that's where there are the majority of people and you've got all the industry. So air pollution in an urban setting is often referred to as smog or industrial smog, which are composed of sulfur oxides and particulate matters tends to be much worse in the winter time because you get these inversion layers where the chemicals that are created can't escape near the surface of the earth so they just kind of stay down near where we breathe at other times of the year the atmosphere might mix better and uh, that results then in those chemicals moving away from the city but again that that's great for the city but it's not so great for the other places those chemicals end up I don't remember off the top of my head if I've got a link to it in Moodle, but if you Google air quality grades or California air quality, you can start looking at the uh, grades that different cities get. Cities like San Francisco get what kind of grade do you think? An A, B, C, D, F? They actually have a pretty high grade, you know, meaning like a B. Again, it's a big city, so why does it get a B when I just told you that the big cities are where the chemicals uh, are, are creating air pollution? Well, San Francisco, for example, has the benefit of being near the ocean. You get that onshore breeze that pretty much is a constant thing. And so where does the air that blows through San Francisco head? It heads inland towards, what, Sacramento. And then from Sacramento, the air heads north or south. More of it south towards Fresno and that area. But even in Red Bluff and Redding, we get some of the air coming up from the Delta via Sacramento. So the reason that there are other rural counties, Butte County, Glen County, uh, Shasta, Tehama, typically have much worse grades even than um, the Bay Area does because we get their air pollutants. It's a function of the wind currents and a function of the topography. So we don't generate as much pollution here by any stretch of the imagination compared to, again, the Bay Area. But because of the ocean wind currents and the topography, we get their pollution. And so then it's even worse as you go south. All of the industry up and down the valley, then the cumulative effects of the air pollution coming in from the bay and going south from Sacramento create basically F, a grade of F, for almost all of those counties south of Sacramento. And the funny thing is, we don't give pluses and minuses for grades at Shasta. Some universities do. You could get an A or an A plus or an A minus. The grade of F is, is really kind of a funny thing when you look at it because you might have a score of, you know, 50, 
and that's an F. But then you look at a place like San Bernardino County or some of the other counties down in LA, and their number might be 300, but that's still an F. It should be an F minus, 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 minus. I mean, it's a really, 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 really bad F, but it's still just an F on paper. So again, it's just a great example, unfortunately, in California of how these chemicals can have impacts in places where they aren't generated. Things have gotten better, though. Don't, don't get me wrong. The smog that was first noticed in Los Angeles back in the 1940s and got worse in the summer and continued to be pretty bad has much, much improved from back then because of the emissions regulations that we have in California, whether you like that or not. Um, it's definitely a good thing from the standpoint of air pollution that we've had higher emission standards on our automobiles than anywhere else in the country. So we have seen improvements, but the biggest cities and, and areas of the San Joaquin Valley are still just nasty in the summer. And unfortunately, even up in those mountains, the air quality may never get better than moderate or even unhealthy just because of all the pollution that's generated that's heading that way. Again, I, I sort of already just finished talking about this, but changes in temperature produce circulation patterns that help spread the air pollution. Again, whether it's onshore breezes caused by the ocean, whether it's you know narrow mountain gaps that are low enough that, that help the wind push pollution over those gaps, whether it's the topography like our valley that kind of is acting like a bowl, the pollution settles in the bowl, and unless you have really strong winds, uh, you get a lot of inversion layers created where basically that bowl traps in the air pollutants and so you get places like Los Angeles, that whole basin. Part of the reason that the air pollution is so bad, aside from the 10 plus million people that live there, is that it's a large basin. So locally, small areas can have these effects. If you live in a small valley in the mountain, you can have these inversions created. You may not have nearly the nasty pollution that you might have in a bigger city, but you can still have that inversion layer that traps in um, a, a colder layer of air near the ground. So even things like, especially in the mountains, it may not be most types of air pollutants, but in the mountains where a lot of people burn firewood for their heat, that smoke can get trapped down near the surface of the earth in the winter time. And again, the, the soot, the pollutant that's generated by burning wood is still a particulate, so it is still a uh, health, health hazard. So again, larger scale or smaller scale, you can still have these effects caused by topography. So a little more history about LA. In 1969, California became the first state to enforce much more rigid emission standards on, on motor vehicles. Currently, we still have the strongest smog control laws. Los Angeles now has cleaner air than it's had in the past 60 plus years. Again, it's improved dramatically as you can see with respect to things like ozone on the chart. But it still exceeds the federal standards. As I mentioned, it still gets a grade of an F. On average, there are about 120 days out of the 360 that are above the federal ozone standards that were set um, in, in revisions to the Clean Air Act back in 2008. So the trend is good, it's gotten better, but it's still not by any means clean and safe air. There's an Enviro discovery that talks about air pollution and how it may affect precipitation. There's research that shows that there are mountain areas that are getting less precipitation than, than is usual. And scientists that study climate are finding correlations between areas that have higher amounts of air pollution with uh, lower precipitation amounts. The example here is uh, an area in China in data that's been collected for over 50 years. Finding higher um, pollution levels have created 
the situation where there has been less and less precipitation. So as if we didn't have a, enough issues with, um, you know, problems caused by periodic droughts and things that we'll talk about later with respect to climate change. Climate change um, might make it warmer or colder or more precipitation or less precipitation, but it's the trend it appears to be that the polluted areas that are more polluted also tend to have lower precipitation. So that's going to compound the problems as well. And then specifically within cities, um, air pollution can have a much greater impact, not only because there are more people there. Again, there are a lot of people in the Bay Area, but they don't have the impact of their own pollution because they're in a favorable sort of uh, topography where the wind kind of blows their pollution inland. But you can have other areas where you get a buildup of heat. Large urban areas have lots of pavement, lots of hardscape, not as much vegetation. So the, air, the area can, can get really hot, the heat can build up, and then radiate into the atmosphere at night, causing what's called an urban heat island. And basically this image shows how much warmer it is right over the downtown area of a larger city and how that air temperature declines as you get farther away out into the more rural areas that have more trees. These urban heat islands can also affect local air currents. Uh, they can kind of block air movement. They can have an impact on weather conditions and uh, can also trap in those particulates to create these dust domes that circulate in these uh, high concentrated urban areas. Again, the dust dome is, is partly what causes that, that yucky looking air over a city, or at least it can be one of the reasons for that look. Again, you have the, the heated air that's kind of a dome over the city, and it kind of blocks the wind from surrounding areas to kind of break into it. So it creates this little bowl of an area where the pollutants that are generated just kind of circulate within that dome, but don't really move away from there. Cities then that are in valleys are, are even more susceptible to this kind of um, situation, especially where there isn't much wind. Then as you get more um, wind picking up, the wind gets strong enough that it can actually break up the dust dome. But then, obviously, that, that, those pollutants have to go somewhere. So then they get blown into the, the, the rural areas farther out of the city. Basically, these dust domes can also generate more thunderstorms in summers, uh, at least in some areas, just because of the heat and the interaction with the atmosphere. So we certainly have a lot of technology that we've been using for quite a while now to uh, kind of skim out some of those air pollutants. Smokestacks used to just be a hollow tube that would put the smoke up high enough, hopefully into the atmosphere, so that it would blow away. Now, all smokestacks have precipitators, uh, filters, scrubbers, different ways of getting especially those particulates out before the, uh, you know, the air gets released back into the atmosphere. So again, the book kind of walks through the process of, of how these work. Probably a good idea to have a general idea how this works, but probably not going to go into a ton of detailed questions about precipitators and so forth. But Bottom line is that this technology, even filters, simple things cost more money. So again, whatever that industry is making, the money that, that it needs to comply with air quality acts is ultimately going to be passed down to the consumer. So the more regulations there are to keep our air cleaner, the more money that that's going to take and that means that's more money that we're going to have to pay as taxpayers uh, for the products that we depend on. Again, like, like taxes or not, nobody likes taxes, but like it or not, how else um, you know, do these technologies get incorporated? 
something that costs money ultimately has to be passed down to, to the consumer, either in paying more for that product or paying taxes that get utilized to, to try and address these problems. The Clean Air Act uh, obviously is, is the uh, important regulation here with respect to air quality. It was first passed back in 1970. It's been amended a few times since then as we've gotten more data about certain things. As I mentioned earlier, places like Los Angeles and in general the United States, our air quality has gotten better. The figure on the right shows specific improvements from 1970 to 2011 with respect to some of the major pollutants, the, some of the, the, the dirtiest pollutants that we tend to focus on, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, the VOCs, the nitrogen oxides. And notice particulates are the only of these five pollutants that have actually increased. Carbon monoxide has dropped dramatically, as have most of the other ones, at least by, say, 50%. But the particulate matter has actually gone up. Any of you who, who might uh, know someone or know something about diesel engines, whether it's uh, agricultural, farm equipment, or, or diesel trucks or trains, there's been a lot stricter regulation on, on diesel engines. So again, more money for the technology that scrubs the pollutants out. So it, it doesn't come from there. There's, there's always been wildfires, so the increase in particulate matter, probably not so much from wildfires. Volcanic eruptions, again, they, they've always happened, so probably not increased from that. So what do you think might be the biggest cause of particulate matter. Why has it gone up in the last 40 plus years? Well, primarily it's those soil particles. Soil that's lost to the atmosphere from agriculture, uh, like disking or plowing fields. Particulate matter is really, uh, in, in, in Shasta County, for example, is one of our biggest sources of air pollution. We don't have a lot of industry, we, you know, we've got automobiles, but why do you think particulate matter is our biggest uh, source of air pollution and where does it come from? Well, in rural counties, that means there are lots of dirt roads, a lot of unpaved roads out in the countryside, whether it's forest service road or, or a farm road or whatever. So the number of those roads really doesn't decline but more people driving on those dirt roads can generate more particulate matter. So again, we've made huge progress with a lot of chemicals, um, but there are still others that um, are gonna be more difficult. How do we solve, I mean, it's a simple solution to solve the, uh, the problem with particulate matter. Um, logging operations already have to water down the roads when they're logging, the dirt roads that they use to get the logs uh, you know, from the forest out to the, the main highways. They have to water those roads down frequently to keep the dust settled. Uh, when you're doing construction, kind of the same thing, have to keep the dust under control. Typically, the challenge comes in, in things like, like agriculture. You, you, you can't really disc a field without creating some dust. And you could solve the dirt road problem by just paving all the roads, right? Well, again, that, that's easy to say, but where's the money come from? If you make every rural landowner pave all their dirt roads, well, it'll never happen. But again, that would be a ton of money that those people would have to pay to pave a road. And so that's never going to happen. So typically in, in rural areas those are, are really the source of the biggest problems with respect to pollutants. As bad of, of, of a problem as air pollution is in the developed countries, it's getting much worse in the developing countries. They are actually producing more air pollution as they continue to industrialize, just like the developed countries did as we moved through the industrialization process. So we have very you know, poor environmental quality, 
but it's not really a priority for them to fix it, just like it really wasn't a priority for us back, you know, until the 1960s and 1970s. They're trying to develop economically, and so they're going to use the cheapest resources, not, uh, not utilize the best technology that's out there to clean the air, like I was just talking about, all the, the scrubbers and precipitators. And basically, because of the drive to develop economically, there are, there are very few, if any, air pollution laws in these countries, or certainly they're not enforced. As I mentioned, they use old technology because it's cheaper. They use more polluting resources like coal because coal is cheaper than natural gas. And as these cities grow and develop and more people buy automobiles and they burn leaded gasoline, which is cheaper to, to manufacture, then those cities are not only going to have greater and greater problems, but again, it's going to contribute to the global, global air pollution problem. Respiratory disease is the leading cause of global death for children now. Used to be other things related to poor water quality, that kind of thing, diseases. But now it's largely attributable to air pollution being generated by the cities that these children are growing up in. And so we see Beijing, China, New Delhi, India... Uh, even um, South America, Santiago, Chile, Mongolia, Egypt, Cairo, Egypt have have growing and grow, growing ever growing air pollution problems because of how quickly these cities are developing. So as bad as all that is, if that wasn't bad enough, we also have this challenge of uh, of air pollution that is generated indoors. So we typically have this notion that if we're outside and the air pollution is bad, we go inside and that's, that's fine. It takes care of the problem. Well, let's go back to these developing countries first. If they're burning wood or using other types of fuels like animal dung for heating and cooking, as in the image on the right, poor ventilation, the women particularly and the children, since they're going to be involved mostly in the cooking and being in their home, are, are exposed to these chemicals every day. The World Health Organization estimates over a million and a half people die annually from uh, smoke that they're exposed to over long periods of time indoors from cooking. And of course this means that the developed countries are going to suffer more from certain things. Radon is, is a naturally occurring gas that, that occurs in the soil, but cigarette smoke or even very young children um, take up smoking, which again was not unusual for this country a hundred years ago. But being exposed to asbestos and other chemicals um, in making things or, or just things are exposed to in their everyday life. More than 20 million employees in this country are exposed to what we call sick buildings, chemicals that are emitted by all the products around us, and basically all of the health effects that are associated with these indoor types of air pollutants result in people missing a lot of work, which ultimately costs those companies a lot of money. And again, that money, the cost of those things are then passed down to the consumer. There's a YouTube I've got posted for this section. Just talks about some of the some of the real common things that we expose ourselves to uh, in our homes: air fresheners, those kinds of things. So, so view that uh, YouTube if you haven't already. I mentioned radon a minute ago. It's basically a radioactive gas that's colorless, odorless, and tasteless. So there's really no way of knowing if you're exposed to it unless you specifically are, are testing for it. It's the result of, of radioactive decay of uranium and so it tends to be concentrated in some areas. It's an important indoor air pollutant in the US in certain areas, primarily in um, the northeastern part of the United States, parts of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. 
it's estimated to be responsible for about 12% of all lung cancer in this country and about 6% of all US homes have too much radon. Typically it gets into the home through cracks in the basement or the, um, the structure, the supporting structure of the home, openings around pipes that go down into the ground for drainage or for our wells and that's how it can seep into the home. Again, it's not something that every one of us really needs to worry that much about. The problem is, if you detect you have it, the only way really to deal with it is to move. You can't really completely stop it from being able to seep up through the ground. So, again, it doesn't affect the vast majority of people, but in certain areas where it's a problem, it's a big source of mortality. Uh, this image in your book shows some of the typical types of uh, products around our home that create health problems potentially. Anything that you can smell. So the example I always use is if you've ever sat in a new car, it smells like a new car, which I guess I don't know how to describe that any better, but I think we all know what a new car smell is. Unfortunately, what that new car smell is, is all of the vapors that are being given off by the plastics that are freshly made when you, when you bought your car. So the chemicals are still sort of decomposing and giving off vapors until they kind of stabilize. So just a little aside here is I always recommend that if you have a new car or, or are riding in a new car, it's always a good idea to keep windows cracked, keep the ventilation system running, basically not trap those vapors in the car where they concentrate enough for you to really inhale them. But think about all the products we buy. You buy a new television, the smell it gives off when it's on, the, you know, the smell new carpeting gives off. Um, any product you buy that, that has a new smell to it is basically giving off chemicals that are probably not good for you. Then you look at all the other things that maybe are a little more obvious. Um, you know, chemicals that smell bad are, are probably bad. Cleaning fluids, um, chlorine that, that's in water, chemicals, pesticides for gardening, gasoline, of course, um, you know, t t tobacco smoke, a lot of the uh, carpeting and furniture and synthetic stuff. It, it's a type of formaldehyde that's given off for a period of time as it, as it starts... Uh, sort of decomposing. So all of these are, are possible sources of, of indoor air pollutants. Again, the bottom line is if you have good ventilation, if you don't put these things in, in confined spaces with no airflow, you let the rooms air out when you can, um, you know, you'll, you'll minimize your exposure. If you live in a city, or you have a, a chlorinated water supply where basically the water is treated with chlorine to uh, kill the nasty things that could be living in there, you're being exposed to very small amounts of chlorine gas, especially when you run hot water or especially in a hot shower. You've got chlorine in the water coming out of the shower, it's hot, the molecules are more active, and you're kind of vaporizing the water. It's coming out in a mist. So there's no real research that I've seen that shows any direct correlation to, you know, you, you, you take hot showers for 20 years and get some negative health effect. But chlorine is a toxic gas, and there is that potential for those people that might be susceptible to it, that it could create negative, um, negative health impacts. So this chapter ends with a case study of an example of a successful um, city that dealt successfully with, with air pollution. Back in the 1960s, Chattanooga, Tennessee was deemed to have the worst air pollution in the United States. 
so bad that you pretty much had to drive around with your headlights on during the daytime just to see where you're going. And because Chattanooga was another one of those cities that was in a topography that basically created a bowl surrounded by mountains, it, it really made it difficult for those air pollutants to be dispersed away from the city. So after the Clean Air Act uh, in 1970, the city established air pollution control boards to um, enforce regulations. And again, 30, 40 years later, um, Chattanooga has lower levels than the federal standards, which again, most places in California um, don't have, even though we have very strict air quality laws, stricter than the federal laws. And then basically um, moving into the 2000s, Chattanooga's continued to move towards being a sustainable um, ecosystem, even with the industrialization that generates air pollutants. And again, please ignore the last bullet there. That's from the publisher, and I just somehow managed to miss it. So 